see, uh, let me go over a couple of, uh, a few things that uh, uh, some of you have asked uh, uh, regarding the assignment and in general how to uh, um, go through solving some of the problems. Uh, for this problem, uh, one of the questions uh, uh, that, uh, that was asked uh, was, uh, do you need to uh, exactly evaluate that, f that uh, for electrons is equal to plus in B plus. So uh, uh, as we had derived earlier in the class, uh, the electron density in the conduction band is given by this conduction band effective uh, density of states times this Fermi-Dirac integral. Uh, and for three dimensions, uh, uh, it's a uh, Fermi-Dirac integral of order half uh, and that uh, uh, essentially looks, the Fermi-Dirac integral looks uh, uh, like, uh, I think, I forget, square root of 2 over pi integral 0 to infinity. So this is uh, an, so uh, this is the nature of the integral. And here, this factor is just uh, the Fermi level minus the conduction band over kt. So, so that's where the physics is. This is the Fermi-Dirac integral. And one of the questions was whether both for n, and similarly, there's a Fermi-Dirac integral for p based on nv and uh, uh, Fermi-Dirac integrals, uh, whether you should evaluate the full integral or not. Uh, so there were two uh, approximations of the Fermi-Dirac integral uh, that, as I mentioned, uh, uh, is Fermi-Dirac integral is roughly equal to e to the power its argument if this argument is much less than minus 1. Right? So that's called the Maxwell-Boltzmann approximation. And uh, uh, on the other hand, the other end of the spectrum, if n is much larger than plus 1 and is positive, this is when this uh, eta is negative, uh, then it becomes, I think it's j plus 1 over j plus 1 or something like that. So it becomes a polynomial with power j plus 1 when the argument of the Fermi-Dirac integral is much greater than plus 1. And if it's much less than minus 1, it's exponential. And this is uh, if, uh, so physically, what, what would this correspond to uh, when EF minus EC is over KT is much less than minus 1, right? From, because that's the argument. And that e effectively means that uh, uh, the uh, Fermi level is much less than EC. I can take it over to that side, minus kt. Right? So in other words, uh, if your uh, conduction band minimum is here and your Fermi level is many, many kts away and below the conduction band, uh, you can already see the carrier density would be very low, uh, would be low, not necessarily very low, but uh, uh, this is the condition when you can apply the, uh, the Maxwell-Boltzmann approximation. So under this condition, you can say that uh, the electron density, or, or if, if it is so, if Fermi level is kind of out here and gap is, that's valence band top, then I can write that n is roughly equal to nc e to the power minus ef over kt. You can write it that way, and that's OK. But in this problem, you don't want to do that. In this problem, you, because uh, uh, you have kind of a very interesting situation where you have a lot of accepted dopants, 10 to the power 18 per centimeter cube, and much less donor dopants, 10 to the power 14, right? much less. Uh, uh, if, uh, uh, but, but on the other hand, the uh, accepted dopants are very f deep, meaning they're very far from the valence band edge. 160 MeV, you need a lot of heat to ionize them. Whereas the donor dopants are very shallow. You need very little energy to ionize them, 10 electron volts. So you don't know beforehand whether it's an N-type or a P-type semiconductor, unless you do this whole thing, you know, the, unless you write down your whole expression and find where is your Fermi level. Right? So you have to do the math here. And for that, I would say do not make any approximations. Just start with this and solve it. Now that being said, uh, if I had said that uh, you have only donor doping 
of 10 to the power, say, I, let's say I had 10 to the power 17 per centimeter cube donor doping with 10 milli electron volts of activation energy and no acceptors whatsoever. Let's say I had that problem. In, in that case, you don't have any acceptors, right? And your donor dopant activation energy is very small. So you are guaranteed. You can, you can say that my Fermi level is probably, you know, reasonably close to the conduction band edge. And I can try and see what this approximation will give me. And then you, you can check it first, where is the Fermi level. And then you can go back and run this whole thing with no acceptor dopants and find it. And you'll see it will be actually pretty reasonable to use the Fermi Dirac, uh, to use the Maxwell Boltzmann approximation in that case, and, and then solve it. So, but yeah, yeah I mean, the, uh, so here, do not make that approximation a priori, just you know, go through that. And the other question is, uh, uh, sometimes you have issues if you're trying to, you know, Fermi Dirac integral, you know, it has a name, an integral has a name because it's not easy to kind of numerically also do. Mm -hmm. And you may have problems uh, with convergence or something like that if you, if you try to run the Fermi Dirac integral, you know, just, uh, just ask it to calculate from a raw perspective. Maybe not, but if you do uh, most uh, software uh, or, you know, Mathematica, for example, they, 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 they have a built-in function, the poly logarithm, that's the name. Uh, so if you say Fermi Dirac integral of the jth order, you know, the most general power j. <coughs> uh, and you can say that uh, for this problem, for example, uh, uh, for the problem um, in this assignment, it's a three-dimensional semiconductor. And this j that occurs inside this Fermi Dirac integral, the most general Fermi Dirac integral is given by one over, this is gamma function, x to the power j over x minus eta. You know. so, so essentially, it's a function of this quantity. And it's an integral. Uh, and this order, the jth order, is, is, is kind of the power here. That's where it's, and then there's a little normalization factor, the gamma function here. Now, uh, just to kind of make a connection to uh, where does this factor j come from, it is really related to the density of states of the, of the semiconductor. So essentially, when we do the integral, we convert it into energy, and you get a dE here and energy minus Fermi energy. And here, what you have is a function, some function of energy, and it is actually the density of states. Mm -hmm. So if you have three dimensions and a parabolic band structure, in 3D, we have seen that the density of states is equal to some coefficients, and then it goes a square root of E minus EC. Right? So, so the power of energy is one half, you know, is e to the power half. Yeah. So that's why J is half. And it's the Fermi Dirac integral of the half order, or the half order, j is equal to half for three-dimensional parabo uh, uh, parabolic band structure. And therefore, you can ask Fermi Dirac integral of half. And here's the variable. And you'll say, well, it's poly log function with this, you know. It's, it's, uh, and then you can ask to plot it. And here's the plot of, of that thing. So, so it's just a uh, you know, uh, something that uh, uh, rises very sharply with it's, it's a plot versus eta, which is the argument. So, and then as you go up, it kind of starts leveling off. So it starts out being an exponential at large negative eta, when it's much less than minus one, right? The minus five, minus four, you know, it's here. here. It starts out exponential, and then when you go to very high positive values, it becomes a polynomial. <coughs> Uh, you know, x to the power or eta to the power. For this case, it's three halves. J is equal to half, so it's just three halves power. You know? Does it make sense? Okay. So now, if you instead of three dimensions, if you were in two dimensions, then your uh, uh, we, we have seen that in two-dimensional parabolic band structure, uh, you have you you, you you that has no dependence on energy. You know, it's flat. The, the density of state is flat in which case j will become zero. There's no dependence here, so it will become zero. And you can ask again, what is the Fermi Dirac integral of, j of the zeroth order? And that is something you can analytically do. It, you don't have to have polylogs <coughs> in this function, log of one plus e to the power eta, you can directly integrate it. Can, so it's just dx over one plus e to the power x kind of integral, right? so you just get a log of that. But for any other order, if you go to one dimension, your eta for one dimension, 
the energy, it goes as 1 over square root of E minus EC. Right? So we had seen those things earlier, in which case uh, the J becomes minus half. And you can ask for Fermi-Dirac integral minus half in this polylog of something else here. I mean, so this J kind of changed from 3 by 2 to 1 by 2. Like, and similarly, for graphene, for example, for graphene, two-dimensional graphene, uh, the density of states as a function of energy is proportional to energy. It's e to the power 1, in which case j is equal to plus 1. And, and then you can do all that stuff. And you can have all this range of uh, functions uh, uh, for this integral, for Dirac integral. And the carrier density is proportional to that, right? as a fun where, where, wherever you move the Fermi level. And what you see is, is very uh, nicely that uh, 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 for very low values of eta, when the Fermi level is very deep in the gap, for example, or you know, uh, much lower than EC, it doesn't matter what is the dimensionality of the system. They all merge into one. Right. And that's the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution. The J, or the density of states, has no influence whatsoever. Right. Does that make sense? It's a very important point. Later, uh, after the break, when we talk about uh, ballistic transistors and MOSFETs and lasers, we'll see this has a huge Im impact on. This is the off state of a transistor, when you're turned off. You know. So off state of most transistors look pretty much the same. You know, I mean, whether you're quantum wire or two dimensions or three dimensions, it doesn't quite have a big effect. Right? But the on state has a big effect because you have a power law with the dimensionality sitting here, you know, e, to the, e to the power j plus 1. So how much current, for example, how much carriers can I inject and, and get at, uh, when my device is on, that the dimensionality plays a big role. The density of states plays a big role. So this is an important point here. So for this problem, uh, do not make that approximation. Just solve it in its full glory and use this function. Uh, uh, when you use the function, it's actually reasonably fast. And uh, uh, so, so uh, for example, uh, uh, you know, I, I set this up. Uh, uh, so you can set it up uh, using. So instead of trying to do the Fermi Dirac integral, I just say, OK, do polylog. You know, I, I know what, what function to use. Just use that function if you're using Mathematica. I'm pretty sure there are algorithms in, you know, if you're using uh, uh, other packages that may do this easily. But, uh, uh, and then uh, uh, here, I made some plots here. For example, uh, here what I'm plotting is for silicon, the band gap is 1.1 EV. So this is 0 EV, and that's 1.1. This is the valence band top EV. And that's the bottom of the conduction band here. That's EC. And so now what I'm plotting here is the, where would the Fermi level be by finding, by solving this equation, where is the Fermi level if I change the doping in the semiconductor? So if I have extremely, extremely light doping and it's n-type doping, this is the top line. So it's, and what I'm plotting it versus is versus temperature. So it also depends on temperature. Where is the Fermi level? Right? So what it's showing is if I have, uh, sorry, for very, very light doping, this is the Fermi level. You can see the Fermi level it starts out being a little further from the conduction band. And then as I heat up, the Fermi level starts going towards the middle of the gap. And why is that? Because the, the intrinsic carriers are getting activated. That's exactly right. So the dopants are mostly activated already, kind of, you know, by this temperature, 200K. If I'm 10 MeV activation energy, most of them are kicked out of the dopant. You know, they're already in the band. But what is changing exponentially as I increase the temperature is the intrinsic carrier density, right? Intrinsic carrier density goes, and I uh, is equal to square root of NCNV as e to the power minus gap over KT by 2 KT. So, yeah. so that's increasing exponentially. There's also some power law temperature dependent. But anyway, so so at some point. Uh, the, the intrinsic carrier density is going to swamp out or become larger than the doping density. You know? And at that point, your kind of Fermi level is, the semiconductor doesn't know their dopants. I mean, it knows their dopants, but they don't matter anymore because they're you know, swamped out by intrinsic carriers now. Similarly, if you have very light P doping, it's kind of like that. But if you start increasing the doping density, you make it harder and harder for temperature to kind of you know, reach and, and activate. So as a result, this is much heavier doping. You know? So you, it, it remains n-type to much higher temperatures, for example. So, so that's how the Fermi level would move. Uh, uh, and for that, you have to solve this equation right, to, to find where it is. And, and the third thing I wanted, uh, is that here or any questions here? 
Okay. Uh, and the third thing I want to show is is uh, one of the plot. One of the plots I've asked you to do. Oh, sorry, it's not yet plotted. So let's uh, run these. Uh, so one of the plots I have asked you to uh, do is, is something like this, where, uh, where, where you're going to plot the carrier density. I, I showed it uh, also in a, one of the earlier classes. And you're, here's for silicon, conduction band, valence band. And here's your electron density, just the n term. Yeah. Just the n term is that. It's increasing exponentially first, right? Maxwell-Boltzmann approximation. It's increasing exponentially. And then, as you hit, you know, there it starts bending over as, as, a, as a, you know, polynomial. Similarly, hole density is kind of this, this way, increase exponentially, and bends over. Doping densities, Nd plus and Na minus. So uh, uh, here, for example, that is Na minus, that's N, uh, sorry, this is uh, Nd uh, Na minus, and this is Nd plus. And so the red and the blue lines are the left and the right hand sides of this equation. And wherever they overlap, that's where the Fermi level is. So, so that's, in this case, the Fermi level is close to the conduction band, and it's about you know, 0.9 EV from the valence band, for example. Right? So it's, and you can uh, change it. You can change, for example, the doping density here and make it uh, uh, larger. And you can see as I increase the doping density, the, 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 uh, the N and P, they don't change at all. They don't respond to all that. Doping, the, uh, what changes is this, you know, ND, uh, ND plus and all that. And then the overlap here will go up, Fermi level will move to the right, and so on. Okay. So is that clear? Uh, so hopefully, you know, it work out. And if you have any problems, either in Mathematica, so one of the things I'd like to warn you, if you haven't already encountered it, no software likes an exponential of a very large number, you know, so for good reasons, and our exponentials are very small numbers. You know. So essentially, if you can massage your numbers and make, feed it, you know, reasonable numbers, it will be happy to do it, but, you know, if it, yeah, so it has all these uh, limits of numbers it can handle, right? So, yeah. so that's, most of the times, that, that's the issue you run against. And if you're seeing that uh, 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 you're simulating something, sometimes you have, you know, if the electron charge is missing in an expression, then you are off by 10 to the power 19, you know, so factor, so that's another thing that sometimes comes into play, so just check those, you know. <coughs> okay. Uh, Uh, now, uh, so uh, any questions before I move forward? Yeah. All right. If not, uh, so let's uh, uh, then also I'll discuss a little bit about the uh, other problems, or essentially the idea of the currents and uh, how uh, I'll, I'll solve a few examples today, uh, which uh, will illustrate uh, that after I am able to put carriers in the bands, uh, how uh, should I think about electron transport in, in, in a semiconductor or a nanostructure or a metal uh, uh, and, and uh, from a completely quantum mechanical picture. You know? So, so how, how and we, had got, we had gotten started on that topic in the last class. Uh, so uh, what uh, I spent quite a bit of time in the last class to derive uh, uh, an expression that uh, you know, in a semiconductor or in any crystal for that matter, uh, we have already discussed and found that uh, a state, uh, the allowed eigenvalues are E of k, which determine the band structure of the semiconductor. Right? It could be conduction band, valence band, some core levels, and all that. So E of k is the band structure. Right? And uh, corresponding to this k state, uh, I have a wave function that looks, uh, I'm going to write it to one dimension, but in, you know, it's, it's, it's completely general. Uh, it's, it, it is a block function, right? We have, we have seen that. And, and the nature of the block function is you have a plane wave, which doesn't know there's a crystal, and the crystal info is sitting here. This is the periodic lattice information. So, so, uh, so we, we have these two quantities, all the eigenvalues uh, and the, all the eigenfunctions of this electron in a crystal are solved once you have done your band structure. And so every, pretty much every uh, physical property of this crystal uh, is buried inside this two information, and it's our job to extract it. And one, the first thing we are asking is, I want to understand currents. You know? So how, do cur how does current flow? Right? And uh, 
So uh, what we did was uh, uh, we, uh, we had already, uh, using continuity equation on Schrodinger equation, we had written down an expression for the current uh, as a function of the wave function. Uh, current, if you know the wave function, how do you calculate the current? And we had uh, derived that in the beginning of the course. And we applied that in the last <coughs> class and found that the, uh, the, uh, you know, the flux, uh, the current flux due to a block state is given by 1 over h bar dE by dK, which is the gradient of the band structure in K space. Or in other words, just the slope, you know, this slope. D by dk, right? Uh, that's what we realized was called the group velocity of state k, right? Times, uh, and this is just a you know normalization uh, factor so mod psi k squared, which is uh, uh, when you integrate over all space, it's one, and uh, uh, it has units. So wave function, just to be clear, uh, whenever I take a wave function and I integrate it over volume, three d volume or one d or two d. Right, I get a one. Right, that's my normalized wave function. If I integrate it over entire volume, therefore the wave function actually has units, and its units are one over square root of the volume, right? Because you're squaring it to get one. So that means my wave function units are one over square root of the volume. And by volume, we uh, I think it should be clear. For one d, it's one over square root of length. For 2D, it's 1 over square root of area, and 3D, it's 1 over square root of volume, I mean, L cubed. Right? So, uh, so we derived this. Uh, it was a little bit of a lengthy derivation, but uh, this is the flux uh, carried by a state k, uh, and uh, it's group velocity times mod psi k squared. And, so uh, uh, and, and based on this, we can write down that the charge current, uh, if I were to write CH, or you can, you know, uh, as a function of k, will be. Uh, the net charge current uh, would be uh, the charge current due to just this state k would be electron charge times you know this uh, this whole quantity here uh, maybe write it as vg of k times mod psi k squared. Right? It just multiplied by the electron charge. You know? And uh, if you want to find the total current, the total current uh, due to all k states, then uh, uh, so uh, I can then write that net or total is a sum over all possible k's of this quantity. Right? But I also need to make sure that these states, k states, are occupied. If, if there are no state, if they are not, not occupied, it can carry a current, but there's nothing to carry that current. Right? So, so it must be occupied. So uh, uh, what I'm trying to say then is uh, uh, I, I take this expression and multiply by its occupation probability, how much was the probability that it is occupied. And that's our most general expression for the current in you know, any crystal. And uh, so that is uh, what I call, uh, what, what one might call as the steady state or uh, in engineering language, uh, the DC, a time independent current that flows in. Meaning if I take this 1D wire, apply a voltage and I let it, you know, everything stabilize, what is the DC, you know, steady state sort of current. You can also do a lot of dynamics with it, you know, how does it evolve with time? And that's something uh, you have already kind of solved in a couple of uh, problems earlier, uh, but let me uh, emphasize uh, the physical meaning here. So uh, the dynamics of uh, how the states evolve. Let's say this state was filled at time t is equal to zero, and uh, uh, then I t at time t is equal to zero, I turned on an electric field or a force, and the force could be an electric field or a magnetic field. In which case, you get a Lorentz force, right? E plus v cross b. That's the net force that can act on that particle with charge q. This particle must have a charge Q for it to obtain this force from these fields, right? So this is the Lorentz force. And that uh, uh, quantum mechanically uh, relates to the transport by saying that uh, all that force is going to do is it's going to change the K vector or the wave vector of the state. So this is K at time t is equal uh, at t. And at a later time, this state can move to this state, and this is k at t prime, k at t prime, and how 
what is the dynamics of this? That's, that equation tells you that. The equation tells you completely. So essentially, uh, what an external force is doing is it's sweeping and changing the k values. If you have a constant electric field and no magnetic field, let's say that's zero, <coughs> then constant electric field, let's say it's just E. It's, uh, don't be confused, it's uh, not the band structure, it's just the energy. Uh, maybe I should use, uh, forget, I mean, this is the net force, so I'm going to use F just to avoid uh, confusion with the band structure E of K. So F is the electric field, let's say, in which case, uh, Q times F is H bar dK dt, and from here you get that the K at time t is K at zero, uh, if you mean t, and, and uh, plus or minus, okay. So, yeah, uh, uh, minus Q F over H bar times time, so, or is it plus K minus, yeah. <coughs> So, so all it's saying is if, if at time t is equal to this k was occupied, then at, time, at a later time, um, you know, the, the electron is going to move over from here to there because of the electric field. And the rate of change of k is linear with time if you have a constant electric field. So it's just sweeping this out. It's, this equation is not telling you at all about what is the actual physical velocity of, of, the, of the electron. It's just telling you what, how, is it, how is the k changing. Now, the actual velocity is completely determined now by your EK diagram, right? because the act physical velocity is the slope at this point, is the slope at that point, right? And so the EK diagram, or in other words, how the crystal atoms are located, if the EK diagram is like this, the velocity, as you start from zero, let's say here, it, it velocity starts increasing, right? The slope is increasing as you go away. If you have a band structure which is more conical, then the velocity doesn't change at all. The slope remains the same as it goes. Right? If you have a band structure which for whatever reason looks like this, and it can, you have seen silicon has you know, kind of a strange band structure, and it starts over here, the velocity initially starts from zero, increases, increases, then starts decreasing, decreasing, and then it starts going the other way, negative, right? All the while, the force electric field is the same, and the k is just going through linearly, and, but the physical velocity is kind of going that way, this way, based on the band structure now. Right? Does that make sense, at least? Uh, so this is a very, uh, initially a weird concept to digest, but it is, it is true. I mean, this is what exactly what hap happens in a crystal. That's what quantum mechanics tells us will happen. Right? And uh, uh, so, so in a constant electric field, uh, the electron can accelerate can decelerate, can go the other way, you know, do all kinds of things in a constant electric field. In classical mechanics, there's no other option other than just to accelerate, right, and increase your velocity. Here, in a crystal, it can do many other things. It can be constant, right? so yeah, velocity can be constant. So uh, uh, now, uh, and, and so uh, very importantly, and so this is the kind of important concept that uh, uh, K is not the actual momentum of the electron, uh, H bar times K is not the actual momentum, it's the crystal momentum. It has all the information of the crystal buried inside it, you know, because K and the way the arrangement of atoms, uh, uh, the atoms are arranged, determine what is the EK diagram, right? Therefore, the information of that is buried inside there. What quantum is telling us is the procedure to find the current, dynamics of current, is find the K at any time, and then go back to your band structure and find out what's your real velocity, you know, because the velocity is just given by the slope or the gradient. Make sense? Yeah. Uh, okay, so, uh, <coughs> any questions here? I think I want to kind of ap apply to a few things now, but any questions? So uh, let's then um, move forward and apply to a few cases. Uh, one of the things we, we had uh, just started talking about in the last class was, uh, uh, oh, oh yeah, before we go there, let me uh, uh, just show uh, a few. I think I've, I've kind of drawn uh, some pictures which are, uh, so yeah, this is a time independent picture, but I want to show you a time dependent picture now. So, so very simple, I mean, uh, uh, here's your band structure, and say I, I start out a constant electric field. Okay. Let's say the electron was sitting here in this K state, and there was no electric field. If there's no electric field and the electron is sitting in this K state, 
what is its time dynamics? Will it go down? Will it stay there? What happens for an electron uh, which is sitting here? It will, yeah, so it's very strange to say it, but it will stay there. You know, this is a stationary state. You have already solved the entire quantum mechanics problem of electron in a crystal, and this happened to be one of the eigenvalues, right? At that k, this is one of the eigenvalues. Just like, you know, for an atom, uh, electrons have eigenvalues. If I put it in a state here or here, it will stay there. You know, unless it emits a photon, emits a phonon, or something like that, which is a system we have not even included yet in this problem. Okay? So for this closed system, it is an eigenvalue. So it will just stay there. It's not going to change. That's why it's stationary state. right? So it will just stay there. And obviously, in a, in a real crystal, it is going to go down. And why? Because it's, it can, it, this thing is moving very fast. You know, it has a high velocity. It's going that way here. right? It has a very high slope. It has a high velocity. It's going to the negative k direction. And sooner or later, there may be, if it was a completely perfect crystal with no defects whatsoever and all that, it will stay there. There's no, no, no way for it to relax. But then, you know, we know that uh, there may be some defects or a lattice vibration. It can, you know, uh, generate a phonon or it can absorb a phonon or a defect, in which case it can have inelastic scattering and it can start coming down. Here, right? so, so we are going to talk about the phonon part later. But if I remove all those possibilities, then it's going to just stay there. Now I turn on an electric field, and the electric field, uh, what it will do is it will sweep the k values. That's, that's you know, very simple. It's just going to change the k values now. Right? So if I have a constant field, this thing is just going to keep going you know, down and going back up. Right? I mean, that's very straightforward, you know, nothing fancy. Uh, the electron is going to, and from here, I can, at any point here, I can go and calculate what is the groove velocity. And you, you'll find that when I plot the velocity here, it starts with zero. It, it reaches a maximum. If I go all the way to the edge of the band, it comes down. So essentially, it's oscillating in real space. That's what it's really going to do. I've not plotted it out all the way till the end, but uh, uh, th that's all. So, in, uh, so if you track this shadow of this particle on the k-axis, k it's, it's linear with time. So, but the energy is obviously parabolic, right? And the group velocity is actually linear too, and all, all that sort of thing, because it's a derivative of that. So that's not terribly interesting, but it's a very important concept that that's what electric field is doing. Yeah. But now, when we put it in a, uh, so that's a free electron. Even if it was a free electron, it was not even in a crystal, this is what it would do. A completely uh, free electron, let's say a completely free electron was going that way initially in a SEM system or a high vacuum system, and you turn on an electric field. The electron will decelerate and then kind of go that way, for example, right? So, so that's physically what it's trying to say, yeah. Uh, but in a crystal, uh, uh, now uh, here, here's, here's what 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 would what, what happen, right? So in a crystal now, uh, let's see. Uh, I want to kind of show this in two stages. This is a uh, kind of a nice transport uh, illustration of what this equation actually means. So in a crystal, uh, because we have already uh, kind of discussed quite a bit about uh, why in a periodic crystal your ek, you know, k and k plus g and k minus g get coupled, right? Because of periodic potential, the, the electron wave, wave vectors k and k plus g and k minus g get very strongly coupled. And that's why I can uh, now, uh, you know, uh, there's a strong interference of, of those states because, uh, you know, the electron wavelength becomes comparable to the lattice wavelength, right? lattice constant. And so the uh, EK diagram, uh, I can kind of start moving the uh, whole band structure with plus k or minus k just in an effort to plot it inside the first Brillouin zone. And we have discussed that the first Brillouin zone, effectively, once you do this, contains all the information about the crystal. Now you don't have to look outside anymore. All the bands uh, from outside have been translated here. Uh, and in this picture, this is the nearly free electron band structure, which you solve for in your assignment. And in a nearly free electron band structure, let's say my electron is located on the red band here, and, and then I turn on uh, uh, the, the electric field, so it will just stay in the band. It will never go to another band. It will just you know, stay in that band. And physically what's happening is in a nearly free electron model, what we have really done is there are no atoms in the crystal. We've turned down the potential, right? But we have only ensured that the wave function of the electron satisfies the periodicity of the lattice. It has the symmetry. It has the block function. So essentially what it means is if you have no coupling, if you have no crystal potential, 
no atoms that can provide you know, the scattering for electrons or, or you know, interference for electrons. It will never go to another band. It will just stay in that band. Yeah. And now you can come in and turn on the periodic potential. And we know that we are going to, you know, there are uh, some places where I can open gaps. right? And, and once you open the gaps, the dynamics will change in a big way. Uh, and then that's really uh, what uh, we, OK, let's see. So here's, so we opened up a gap now. Okay. So now you have a situation when the electron, if it starts out in this band, here's the band, here's another band, you know, and here's the gap that you have opened because of the potential. And if the electron starts out here, it, 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 it now has a problem going to the next uh, band because there's a gap now. Right? So, so there's no continuous spectra of energy. So the electron will continue uh, do, you know, doing cycles in the same band now. It will not go to the other band anymore. Does that make sense? So, so, uh, uh, so, so and, and it will still go linearly with k, uh, with time, it's you know, if you have a constant field, but it will not escape to the other band. Unless, and this is something we're going to talk about later, the gap is small, or your field is extremely high. Okay? If the field is a few megavolt per centimeter, there's a finite probability that the electron can make a transition to that band. You know? From this band to that band, it is a finite probability. It's small, and it goes down exponentially with the, with the gap as well. And that's called tunneling. That's quantum mechanical tunneling from one band to another. This, this particularly would be called a Zener tunneling from valence band to conduction band. You, know, you can actually tunnel uh, with an external electric field. But the field has to be extremely high. And we are going to talk about that later quantitatively. OK, so uh, uh, just to uh, want to stop here uh, and ask uh, if there are questions, I want to kind of pause for a little bit. Here. Yeah. Why, when we didn't have the band gap, were we going up the red uh, band? Yeah, right. And then <coughs> suddenly when we reach like, like about one in the K side, yeah. we just lose all of our energy and go back to negative one on the K side? Or is that just we're not showing the transition? Oh, you mean uh, I I along this direction? Yeah. Ah, OK, good, good point. So, so uh, along, uh, um, you know, if, if, if we are looking at the nearly free electron model, uh, the one thing that, uh, because there are, we have turned off the crystal potential, the first thing is it cannot, if it is on one band, if it's k, if you have given it a certain k. Sure. For this picture, it is k plus g, you know, because yeah. I've m moved this band kind of to the left, right? It's k plus g. So that's really the whole block function for that state happens to be e to the power i k plus g times uh, 1 over square root of l. That's, that's the whole block function. It's a free electron. And uh, I think it's a kind of a instructive to look at this because it is really a block function. Uh, you can show that it is not show. You just split it up into e to the power i k x, okay, times e to the power i g x over square root of l, okay. So this is your plane wave part, right? And this is your periodic potential part, you know, periodic part, because you can see that g is a reciprocal lattice vector, two pi over a, right? If you translate x to x plus a, this will come back to itself. Right? This is a periodic part, which is a u, k, u corresponding to g here. Right? So, right? so this is your full block function now. It's a free electron, but you can write on your full block function here. Right there, right? So as a result, if the electron is in that state and uh, is in that band, it cannot make a transition to the other bands because the only way the electron can go from one band to another is if there's a crystal potential. The crystal potential, if the crystal, if the atom is in, this, in its way, if the atoms are in its way, only then it can go from k to k plus g or k minus g or you know, make a transition to another k. If not, you know, an external electric field has no, no chance of making that transition for you. It cannot change the nature of the blo block function or the symmetry of the block function. Uh, uh, but it, uh, once you turn on the crystal potential, that's when you can make the transition. So physically, when I say, so the, you know, uh, I think words become a little hard to explain this pro thing now, but the thing is, this, we are calling it one band, but actually these states came from one free electron band, and those states came from another free electron band. Right? So it is actually making a transition in, the, in that sense now, right? To stay within the same uh, uh, EK uh, uh, plot. Does that make sense? I mean, so it is. So one way to look at it is it, it was going along k minus g, and once it reached this point, its wavelength become comparable to crystal, and it got you know 
not scat I mean, effectively interfered very strongly with the crystal, and its K became K plus G now, K minus G to K plus G. Now. So that's way to, one way to look at it. So, yeah. So, yeah. In the free electron case, though, yeah. before we had gap equals zero, then it's technically going off to infinity. But yes. your manipulate just loops it over and over again. Okay. Correct. So, so in a free electron, if, if it's a really free electron, you don't have any of these bands. You can't band, do band folding or anything like that, because there's no G. Or in other words, if there's, it's a free electron model, your you know, A is infinity. Yeah. Right. So I mean, there's no, I mean, there's no periodicity whatsoever. So you have basically just one band that keeps going. right? And uh, so it will, you know, go to very high energies. There are obviously physical limits. You can't go. Uh, so, so, so one of the things is the slope starts increasing, right? And you know, this, nothing can go speed of, fast in speed of light. So there are some of these limits and all that. So, uh, so there's a certain level to which you can reach. And they, uh, you know, in the Cornell uh, synchrotron facility, they are at 0.95 or 99 times speed of light for electrons. They are actually moving electrons at that speed, right? So at that time, by that time you start, you know, radiating and all that sort of thing. So, so this, you know, so this is uh, at this. This is a low energy phenomena, or another way to say it is non-relativistic. Uh, okay, yeah. So, <clears throat> uh, any more questions? So, so yeah. Uh, the optical uh, no no it uh, I will talk about optical phonon today uh, in the re remaining half hour uh, uh, that has to do actually it is uh, not exactly the same problem uh, the the fact that it can transition from here to there is uh, related a bit more to uh, a close analog of the optical phonon which is the photon or light you know? so another way to make it jump from here to there is shine light on the semiconductor with this much energy and it can go there. You know, it, it can actually absorb that light and go there if, if, if some other things are possible. Phonons can also make that happen if the gap is small enough, smaller than the phonon energy. The phonon energies in semiconductors are typically tens or maybe <coughs> about 100 millielectron volts MeV. So that's 0.1 EV is kind of on the higher end of phonon energies. But the gaps we are talking about are about 1 EV or you know, something like that. So phonons don't quite. Obviously, they contribute some, but not quite you know, much to make that transition. But as you know, the intrinsic carrier concentration, the intrinsic carrier concentration is due to thermal excitations. Right? Thermal jumps from here to there. And that is entirely due to phonons. And that's the order of magnitude of how much carriers can you kick out of here to there just because of heat. Does it make sense? So that's the order of magnitude number. Uh, whereas uh, by doping and all, you go much, much larger than that. You know, so, yeah, so, yeah. Uh, I will talk about tunneling in, in more detail later, but uh, just trying to point out that a transition from lower band to higher band with a very high electric field in DC case is similar to transition from low energy to high energy band with light, but light is extremely high frequency. You know, so the, ele the electric field magnitude may be small, but the frequency at which it's oscillating, you know, the, uh, light is electromagnetic, so that you have oscillating electric field. The, the, the frequency is what makes the big difference there in, with, with light. You know, yeah. We'll come to that. <clears throat> okay. So uh, uh, and then you know a uh, uh, lot of uh, inter other interesting things happen once you turn on the uh, magnetic field, but we are not talking about that as of now. Yeah. All right, so uh, uh, then uh, let's see. I, I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, the other problems uh, you're looking at. Uh, and then we'll do a few examples now uh, about uh, 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 the transport problem. Let me just uh, and blank. How do I blank the screen? Oops. OK, so. <coughs> So I'm going to, uh, you know, start using this this sort of a picture now to uh, calculate uh, transport. Uh, and one of the things we had started out in the last uh, 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 last class was uh, to look at uh, uh, the, the ballistic uh, transport problem in one dimension. So in one dimension, let's say uh, the band structure. I have calculated my band structure, and I know it. 
And uh, uh, so the problem we were looking at was uh, if I had created, uh, you know, if I had a 1D, uh, uh, 1D structure with, uh, so in, in real space, I was sketching this picture in the last class that uh, I have. So now this, oh, this diagram uh, in energy and real space now, not K here, okay? Let's call it X. Uh, this, this sort of a diagram where I'm plotting energies in the Y axis and real space in the X axis, we are going to call as an energy, uh, energy band diagram, okay? Band diagram. That's the name we're going to use, band diagram, but energy versus K, which is the band structure. Uh, so we're going to call as the band structure. If the E versus K looks like this, uh, that, that we're going to call as band structure in this course. Just nomenclature, no? band structure, band diagram. Band diagram is how is thing changing in space. Right? And band structure is the EK diagram. It's intrinsic to the, to the material, the band structure. Yeah. Uh, basically, just to, you know, uh, I think I've uh, mentioned this a couple of times earlier, but just to uh, remember, uh, the band structure is your, you know, essentially you have, this is the pictorial uh, representation of the complete s solution to the Schrodinger equation for the electron in the crystal. You have all the eigenvalues here, right? At every k, uh, here's eigenvalue, here's another eigenvalue. These are, you know, just like your hydrogen atom has eigenvalues here, here. This is what happens to the electron once it's in the crystal. It's the whole picture is right there in front of you in the band structure. Right? So uh, uh, now, uh, so, the, so, so the problem we were asking in the last cl class is, is uh, this is something you are solving, but it's also the most fundamental problem of quantum transport. That I have two metal electrodes, left and right. And for future purposes in the course, we're going to call the left as the source and this as the drain, the source and the drain. Uh, this is the nomenclature from transistor uh, physics. Uh, so le le left is the source. For a two terminal, it doesn't matter what you call you know, source and what you call drain. Uh, it's symmetric, but uh, uh, we're going to call it that way. So you have a source contact and a drain contact, and externally, uh, and they're connected by a 1D conductor, one-dimensional quantum you know, conductor. Uh, conductor, everything is quantum, so it's just a conductor. Right? And we're going to solve this quantum mechanically. That's what we want to do. And, and, and what we are uh, doing now is, is uh, connecting this, these two electrodes, metal electrodes externally, to a battery. And the battery is, uh, has a voltage V. And uh, uh, so, OK, uh, I drew the arrow here. So uh, such that the electrons move in this direction. You know? So electrons move in that direction in which the current will flow this way. So current flows this way, and uh, voltage is the, so this is a voltage V applied along, across these two electrodes. No? And this is your one-dimensional conductor. And right after this, we'll do two dimensions and three dimensions. So it's just a slight tweak. OK. Conductor or semiconductor, I mean, 1D crystal. Let's just call it a crystal for that at this point. No? And uh, so I'm going to kind of re, uh, I, I'll do, uh, discuss this all over one more time uh, uh, because I think uh, uh, this needs a lot of emphasis too because some of these concepts do require quite a few, you know, uh, number of times to get comfortable with. So, so it's actually, a, as you might imagine, microscopically there are a lot of things going on in this, you know, for a current to flow in this material, right? So on the left side you have a metal with its Fermi level, so this is what uh, is the Fermi level of the metal, and let's call it E Fermi of the left side, of the, of the left electrode. Here's the Fermi level of the right electrode. And the difference between the two energies uh, of the left and right electrodes, what is that? That is exactly equal to the applied voltage times electron charge, Q times V. So. Uh, Q times V is how much the energy here is lowered compared to that energy. That's the meaning of a voltage, so, so, right? So, so the chemical potential, or the electro uh, Fermi level of one electrode is Q times V lower than the other. That's the physical meaning of it. And this, any system always wants to reach equilibrium, and this system, the moment I apply a voltage V, will also try to reach equilibrium now, right? 
you'll try to reach equilibrium. And the way, uh, the, I mean, if I look at the problem now, it says, oh, there are a lot of electrons here at much higher energy than that, right? Does that make sense? I mean, and, and so they would like, the way they can reach equilibrium is if electrons are transferred from here to there. Right? It's like water flow, right? You have a higher water level, lower water level, and there's a pipe connecting the two, right? So to reach equilibrium, there must be flow of particles from left to right. This is exactly the reason why the particles will flow, There's, you know, to, to, to re try to reach equilibrium. But now, uh, uh, you, you can imagine that uh, a 1D conductor only has a finite number of states that it can allow inside it. It's like a waveguide. It's trying to push light through it. Uh, each of these is a mode of the waveguide, if you like this. You can only fit a certain number of modes in it. It's a 1D conductor. There are a finite number of states. And uh, uh, so now, uh, uh, the particles that can go from here to there have to access those states to go, go from left to right. Does it make sense? They have to go through those states which are available. Right? So, uh, so uh, you can look at this. Uh, so if I go to this plane, you know, in, in this point in, in this x-axis, and say, what are the k states available in the semiconductor or the con you know, 1D crystal? What are the states available? So I can sketch here. At this very point, I can sketch the EK diagram, and it will look something like that. Just don't get confused, because this is EK, but it's actually at only that point in X. Right. Only at that point in X. So every point here has its own EK, EK band structure. Every point in the band diagram has its own band structure. That's the meaning of it. So, so it's moving down. And this is the minimum of the conduction band. This is EC. And what we're saying is the EC is going down. I have sketched it linearly, but it's not necessarily linear. It has, it has to satisfy Poisson equation and all those other things. It is some functional form, but it's going to decrease like that. And that, that is your EC as a function of x you know, as you're changing. And then you have a gap, and the gap you know, essentially just follows. Kind of, and these are all filled states, but filled states are not carrying any current, only empty states are. Right? Or, or you know, available states are. OK, so now uh, the left electrode, uh, let's look at a situation here, uh, somewhere here. We're going to be able to calculate the current by just looking at this interface, at this, at this junction. But let's look at this uh, at the middle of the uh, one, you know, uh, between the two electrodes. So there are states here that are uh, pro these are propagating states. They can move to the right with a certain groove velocity. This one is somewhat low. This is higher, 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 right? These are moving faster as you go up. These are group velocities. And the left electrode has electrons. Uh, uh, it, it's a metal, so it has electrons going to the right. It has electrons going to the left, both, right? right. So, but the only electrons from the left electrode that can enter this you know, 1D crystal are the ones that are going to the right. I mean, physically, you can see that you know, if, if electron is going to the left, it's not going to enter that crystal because the crystal is on the right side. Right? So, so, so as a result, these will get injected into these states. If the energies match and the momenta match, K, E, and K match, they'll get injected into those states. And the idea of a metal is it has a huge number of electron states. It has a very large Fermi surface, as you know. And you can always find some states in, that match in E and K. Subject to question. I mean, people are starting to question this even today. But uh, I think I mean that that's the assumption we're going to go go with now. That the electrons can get injected, uh, uh, e, you know, into the state, and and the Fermi level here is here, but uh, Fermi level is here, but uh, 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 e Fermi level. But then we know that the Fermi Dirac distribution is one, and then goes to half, and then goes down. Right. That's your occupation function in the metal. And it's going down exponentially here. This is how the states are occupied. So in other words, uh, the right going states in the, in, the, uh, in, the, in, in the 1D crystal are going to be populated by the right going states that got injected from the metal, from the metal on the left side. They, they, they're going to uh, reach. And the point that's right next to it, you know, this, at this point in the 1D crystal, uh, the right going states, these states, will share the same properties, Fermi level as the left electrode. They are in equilibrium with the left electrode now. So th this is a very important concept. Uh, there is no barrier between them. 
you know, if you have a barrier, it becomes a short key diode, which I'll talk about next. Uh, but if you don't have any barrier uh, between them, then uh, this is what you call as the Gibbs equilibrium in thermodynamics, which means that there's a free exchange of particles and energy. You know, and, and so bo both particles and energy. And so uh, the free ex exchange of particles here makes it reach equilibrium, and it shares the same Fermi level on the left side. In semiconductor language, this would be called a quasi-Fermi level, because Fermi level is a concept at equilibrium, but you are not in equilibrium. You're flowing current through it. Right? So, so, yeah. so, uh, so this is kind of a non-equilibrium situation now. And then, so this is called a quasi-Fermi level. But you know, regardless, OK. So this, these states share the same Fermi level as the left electrode. And I think you can see from the same picture that uh, the, the states that are going to the left in the semiconductor, in, in, in the crystal, the states, uh, the electrons that are going to the left came from here. right? They, they, they came from here. And at this point, ballistic transport means we are saying that there's no possibility of scattering. If electron is moving to the right inside the 1D crystal, it cannot get scattered and turn to the left. It, it, it's going to stay in that state till it kind of goes and gets out of the other, other, other side. So, so the problem of a steady state or DC current is Really, you can see, I mean, the, the, this is a general algorithm for finding the current in, in the DC case. For any, any dimensions, any problem, uh, the DC quantum current calculation uh, is first job is to find the band structure, right? And we are saying we know that now, right? band structure, right? Second job is find f of k, the occupation probability of each of those k states. right? Find f of k. And what we were arguing about now, about equilibrium and all that business, is trying to find that f of k. How, what is the occupation probability of the right-going k states, left-going k states, that's the second step. right? And the third step is use that formula. You know, and and that, that's really it. So just use this whole thing, and you get your total current. Right? J net is equal to sum over all k states uh, q you know q over h bar a gradient uh, i'm just writing in the more general form f of k uh, mod psi k squared f of k so so that's uh, your current so, so you're done this is the procedure for dc current calculation right? find band structure find the occupation of the k states sum over all group velocities, and you're done. Right? So, so, so that's it. Now, if you want to find dynamics, it's equally sim in a very similar. The first step is find k at a function time t, uh, at, as a function of time t. Right? And then go to e of k. Right? If you know k, feed it in here. Find, uh, oh, oh, yeah. So if you find e of k, again, you have to find. So essentially, you have to build in the time here, that, uh, the time variation of k will come from the force of the electric field. So, so this is, you can feed it in through here, and you can also calculate the time-dependent current. But we are not talking about that at this point. So we're just looking at the DC current. At this point. So once I apply voltage, and all the transients have died out, what is the net current I'm measuring as a function of voltage? That's, that's what we're asking, right? I as a function of V. OK, so uh, for the 1D case, uh, uh, what we said was uh, the, the right-going states uh, are filled up, um, or rather, the right-going states have a Fermi level that is that of the left contact, and the left-going states, you know, left-going states have a Fermi level that's of the right contact. And now, be because I know I've, um, you know, and, and 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 I gave a physical reasoning for it, and let me just assure you, it's an approximation, what I what I just said. And this is the ballistic approximation, that if you don't have any mixing of carriers, this is what you'll get. The right-going states will have a Fermi level of left contact. Left-going states will have a Fermi level of the right contact, because that's where the carriers were injected from. The moment I allow any scattering, any form of scattering, there is phonons, defects, whatever, this difference, what is this difference then? Right? And in the ballistic case, that is exactly equal to the voltage you've applied externally. This is how you know, a macroscopic you know, turning of a knob externally is affecting all the quantum properties inside this crystal and all this you know, nanostructures and all that. So this is actually Q times V. The populations are being controlled by the battery for you. Right? Uh, 
Now, if you have any scattering and other things, this difference is going to go down. That's, that's what happens. You know? so, so you don't get as much current as possible. You just always get less than the ballistic limit. This is the maximum you can get out of it. Yeah. And the net current now uh, for 1D uh, is, is uh, J net will be uh, here. We can sum it over all k states. Uh, group velocity is 1 over h bar d e over dk. Uh, occupation functions, uh, uh, I'll write it in this way now. Okay, So I will first say, what is the j going to the right? This is just a symbol. What is the net current flowing to the right side? And how will I calculate that now? What, for me, what functions do I use now? So is this the group velocity. Let me just write psi k squared. And then I must have the occupation function of the k states, right? And this I'm summing over only k going to the right on the or positive case. Okay? And here I should have Fermi function of with what Fermi level, right? So to the right, should those carriers came from the left contact, right? So Fermi level of the left side. Similarly, current going to the left is k going to the left. Same deal, you know, 1 over h bar d by dk mod sum k squared f of for me right. Scary is going to the left, came from the right contact, so e for me right. So these are the Fermi Dirac distributions. And, and so the net current is always uh, uh, J, you know, difference of the two. You know, it's very important. It's always the difference of the two. Uh, and uh, and then that that will be uh, okay. So you get the difference of the Fermi functions, uh, right? The difference of the uh, um, okay. Let's actually uh, you know this this you can do, and you are already doing in the side. But what I want to do is just calculate this this quantity. Let's just calculate this quantity, and uh, just the right going part of the current uh, is is a. Uh, uh, Sorry, I didn't write the electron charge and all these other spin and valley degeneracies for you, sir. Q, spin, and valley. Q, spin, and valley. Right? So this is your, how many k states are there for e, the, this many copies of that k state, and this is the charge for charge current. So Q times Gs times Gv. And mod psi k squared, uh, from the argument I said earlier, is 1 over, w w for one dimension, it's 1 over length. Right? You can see that. For one dimension, mod psi k squared is 1 over the length. So I take that out. And uh, I'm, you know, so this is in a free electron sort of picture at this point. Uh, then I sum over k. Instead of summing over k, I'm going to convert it into an integral over closely spaced k values with 2 pi by L is the difference between any two k points. So sum over k, you can write it like that. And then I write the rest times Fermi EF left. Right? So, so that's something we did. And, and for the 1D case specifically, uh, what you get is, uh, uh, you know, the, it, it actually, uh, uh, interestingly, does not depend on the band structure. Uh, and and, and uh, uh, you get Q, G S, G V over so L and so L and L go away, uh, two pi. And what are we integrating for? For just the right going carriers, we start from here, and we go all the way. We can go all the way to infinity, right? We can go all the way to infinity, assuming that the Fermi Dirac distribution is going to kind of cut down, you know, at, uh, once it reaches very high uh, values. So you can go de, so there's a 2 pi and there's a h bar that comes out. You can kind of see already q over h bar appearing here. You know? So this is a characteristic q squared by h, h is the characteristic quantum of conductance, and so all that. And, and, and then you get a Fermi function here, uh, Fermi level of the right, you know, from 0. You can put it to infinity for all you care. It's fine. Right? So, and, you, and then now you see you get a kind of a Fermi Dirac integral again, right? You can evaluate it exactly if you want. I mean, in this case, it's, you can evaluate it exactly because it'll be like logarithm of one plus something. Uh, uh, now, um, 
So instead of energy, uh, I could have uh, done it, uh, calculated this in the, uh, just in, in, in values of k with values of k as well. Uh, in which case, uh, so essentially, I just wanted to kind of uh, show here that uh, the j going to the right will become after you take this into account. The dimensions of this quantity is energy, right? So, and I think you know there's only one uh, game in town in terms of the energy scale here. It's q times v. Right, I mean that's the only dimension in, uh, with energy, and you will get j going to the right will be q squared by h times g s g v. H is just two pi h bar, which is in the denominator here, times uh, you know it won't be the entire part of uh, q v because uh, uh, let me write it as j right minus j left will be equal to this times at t goes to 0 Kelvin. You can calculate this exactly. I'm saying that this is something you're doing the assignment. But at t goes to 0 Kelvin, it will become this times v. You know? So that's, that's what it's going to be. The net current will become just that from here. And then that is, that is what we are calling as the quantized conductance, the quantum of conductance. Because uh, in 1D, the current density and the current have the same units because there's no you know, uh, lateral extent in one dimension. It's just a line. So the current uh, uh, becomes equal to this quantum of conductance times the voltage V. And quantum conductance is just Q squared by H times the spin value degeneracies. So the current as a function of voltage, this is what we had asked to find. And this is how we get. Right? So, yeah? When you're doing the integral, can you set EFR, let's say, to zero? And then, yeah. Uh, yeah and so. That's a very good question. So in this, in this problem, uh, uh, that uh, yes, in this problem, do that. You know, in, in this problem, set EF uh, L minus EFR is equal to QV. But you are saying that you need both values, right? You also need. Yeah, so that's what I'm yeah, saying. Why yeah. can't we shift the energies set one to yeah. zero? Yeah, right. So that that thing comes along the moment you have a, a situation where, in a two-terminal device, you can always do that. You know, just shift it. But in a three term, we're going to actually what we're going to do, you know, after the break and all that is we're going to put a gate on it, and uh, we'll have a third terminal to control this. That's the transistor, in which case you can't do that. You, you know, the gate controls where EFL and EFR, with respect, you know, uh, it controls a little bit more than so. But in this problem, yes. So let me uh, um, then say, yeah. Uh, you said when you uh, change the sum to an integral, and as so you throw in the dk over 2 pi over l, that only in 1D? This is only in 1D. What, what, is, what we're doing here is just in one dimension. So, so in like 2D? We're going to do 2D now. Okay. Right. Okay. So let's look at the 2D case. That's a good question. So uh, in the two dimensions, uh, so physically you can see uh, how we are trying to find this f of k by saying that I have electrodes connected to it. And the right going carriers are con sharing the Fermi level of, of, of the left electrode, and the left going carriers are sharing the Fermi level of the right electrode. You know, and I think there are many analogies to this. I mean, you can think of, you know, a highway and uh, two lanes, and you know, if the cars cannot turn back, then uh, clearly this, you know, all the cars that are going that way must have come from this city and not that. You know, I mean, that's the physical meaning of it, really. Right. So, so this is the ballistic transport model. So uh, let's look at two dimensions. In two dimensions. Uh, this is essentially the same idea, but just a geometrical, geometrically slightly more work, uh, and, and and you you get a two D integral now and all that stuff, right? So, so in two dimensions, then uh, let's do it here. Right. So, two D. So in 2D, I'm going to basically go in and directly plot the k-space of uh, uh, the uh, band structure kx and ky. Right? And, and uh, in kx, ky, the band structure, we're going to, I'm going to just explain the, the parabolic band structure. You can do graphene. I mean, all of them just is a change in E of, as a function of k. The physics is all the same. Uh, the band structure details are slightly different. So a parabolic band structure means your E of kx comma ky is equal to h square by twice an effective mass times kx square plus ky square. That's your two-dimensional band structure, right? You can write it as 
this minimum we have written as zero, or you can write it as EC, is the conduction band edge, if you might. Does this make sense? Okay. And the valence band may be kind of down here. I'm not worrying about that. I'm just looking at the conduction band at this point. So, so uh, to be to be comp you know to be more accurate, kx comma ky is equal to EC plus that. So, that's your total conduction band structure. And in K space, uh, I have uh, a lot of K points here, right? And uh, let's say I have filled up. Uh, I started with a 2D electron gas, which had you know, all the states till this energy filled up. You know, so all these states were filled up. It's like a bowl in this you know, paraboloid. So those states were filled up, in which case here, in K space, you'll have a circle. Basically, if you project all those states down to the K, KX, KY plane, you'll have a circle. This is the Fermi circle, right? And uh, at zero, uh, applied voltage, uh, what you have, and this is something you have solved multiple times earlier, that you have equal left and right going states. Right? E equal number of left and right going states occupied. So what, what I'm physically drawing here is at zero Kelvin, all these states have f of k is equal to 1, and all states outside of f of k is equal to 0. Right? At 0 Kelvin, as you increase the temperature, some of these states get, you know, the Fermi function here starts getting a little, you know, at 0 Kelvin, Fermi function is very sharp. It goes from 1 to 0. But at higher temperatures, it starts, you know, the edge gets getting a little diffused. Right? So, 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 so as a result, this part gets a little diffused. But deep inside the circle, these states still have 1, and these out, very far outside are still 0. And, and now, the question we're going to ask is, uh, how does current flow if I come in and I connect this 2D uh, sheet of graphene or you know, some other sort of two-dimensional electron gas, and I connect it to two metal electrodes, just like with for three dimensions, and then I go, go in and apply a voltage again. What's the current that's going to flow now? Right? So that's the 2D problem. And I, I think you can see now that uh, in two dimensions, physically too, intuitively you can imagine that the electron can go this way, or it can go that way, or it can go that way, that way. So it has a whole range of directions it can go in, right? And in the, in the, that's what this is representing, that each of these states is representing a different K state. This state is going in that direction. You know, that state is going in that direction because the group velocity, Ky, is 1 over h bar, the, the gradient of E of k. And the gradient happens to be 1 over h bar. You can take a gradient of the kx and ky. So it's partial this over kx, right? d by dkx or that. And uh, uh, so what you get here is h bar over m star, h bar by m star, kx times the x direction. This is just a unit vector in the k space times the y direction, unit vector in the k space. That's your group velocity. And you can see the velocity has units of h bar k over mass, which is momentum over mass, which is velocity, which is still has the right units. And uh, so that's your groove velocity. And, and now if I ask you, uh, what's the current, you're kind of done almost. The next question really you have to answer is, what is f of k? And then plug this in, right? Then, now what is f of k? f of k is, again, uh, I've connected it to two terminals. Here's my qv. So now what you can see is these states have an energy, uh, the, 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 the energies uh, to which this, so essentially all the right going states will share the Fermi level of the left side again, and uh, the left going states will share the Fermi level of the right side, right? So in other words, the f of k for those states, for the right going states is one over one plus e to the power, the energy of that state, e of k, minus Fermi level of the left electrode over kt, right? That's the occupation function of those things. Occupation function of these things is 1 over 1 plus e to the power e of k. If I tell you the k, you know what, what is e. It's given by this expression. Minus e Fermi of the right side over k. And then you do the same business. Plug, plug it in. And, and now the current, you have to be very careful with the current part. Not careful, I mean, just have to pay attention. If I apply a voltage like this, the net current in this material, the net current is going to flow in that direction. Right? Along that direction. So what I would do, I mean, there are many ways to solve the problem, but here's a, here's a suggestion. It's geometric and it's, you know, kind of intuitively makes pictorial sense. Here's a state. 
this state is going in that direction, right? It's not going in this direction. It has angle. What I want to do is really find the net current in going in this direction because the net current going in that direction and this direction, or in that direction, this direction is actually zero. The net current. There, there is current still going, but they're equal and opposite. Right? The only thing that's broken here is the one going to the right or going to the left based on the voltage externally applied. That's the only thing that's broken. Everything else is balanced out exactly. But what I'm trying to say is, let's say I ask you the question, just find the current due to only the right going states. That's a very well-defined question. No problem. Right? You can find it. And how do I find it? I will go and take this expression and say, uh, again, I'm going to find the current going to the right is Q times GSGV sum over all K going to the right group velocity, I just found the group velocity, h bar over m star. And here, what I'm going to do is uh, I already know that if I take, uh, 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 so, so, uh, so what I can do is uh, go, when I say going to the right, I can say j along the x direction, the current going in the x direction, in which case I just need to choose the kx, and I'm done. I don't need to worry about anything else now. Right? And assuming whatever is the occupation function, I'm just saying that all of these are occupied till a certain Fermi level. And you can just do that, right? So f of k. And that shares the Fermi level of the left contact or whichever you know, situation you have put it in. So, uh, such an so now when we convert it into an integral, this is the last thing we're going to do uh, right now. And then when we meet later, we can discuss a few more things. Oh, mod psi k squared. So that thing will just give you 1 over L squared, or if you want to consider length and width, W. So it will give you 1 over L times W or L squared, you know, which is, if they're the same. And then your integral here is a two-dimensional integral, because you're in two-dimensional k space, okay, over 2 pi over L squared. This is an important point. And then, uh, then you get h bar kx over m star and f of k. And I already took care of that. Right? So, OK, so, so it, and, and I, I'll repeat this in the uh, class in the afternoon. But now, this is an integral you should be able to do. Uh, uh, kx, uh, I, I generally would suggest converting it into, into spherical or you know, polar coordinates. All you're doing is taking a function, k, this, taking its x component, taking this one, taking its x component, and you're just summing over all these things. So this is summing over how much. So these states carry a lot of current. These states carry very little current, and so on. Right? So you're summing over all of them, and that's what the integral does. And it's, it's uh, OK, so Q, G, S, G, V over you know, L squares go. And, and what you get here is you can write it as k times dk times d theta. So you can break it up into polar coordinates, k and theta, right? Uh, and, and you can solve it in that, that way, in, in, which, in which case your kx becomes k cosine theta. Right? And just integrate it over. Uh, you, you control your theta here. If you are just finding the current going to the right, theta goes from minus pi by 2 to plus pi by 2. right? And k goes from 0 to some value here. So you just sum it over the whole thing. You know? it's, a, it's an area integral. You know? So that's all. You can do. And in 3D, it becomes a volume integral. And in, if you look at the Schottky diode, it becomes a volume integral in a strange way. Only certain carriers can go through. The carriers that have energies larger than a barrier height can go through. You know? So you just integrate over that thin stripe you know, and all that sort of thing. So we're going to do that in the extra class, which is at uh, 5.15 in Thurston 203. I think we've got it. All right, let's meet there. <coughs>